for Bruce Wayne's story to be sufficiently believable, uh, sufficiently epic, I felt it was very necessary in the early stages of the film to have Bruce Wayne disappear, as indeed in the history of the comic books, it, it's clear that he disappears for about seven years or so. Rosal Ghoul. That, to me, is a fascinating concept, the idea of this heroic figure who, as a very flawed character, a very human character, leaves the place that he's ultimately to return to and travels and learns and then returns as a changed person. If I hadn't been scared, they would still be alive. And do you still feel responsible? My anger outweighs my guilt. Come. Hello there. Back to one, we'll get safety on that. We knew one of the biggest set pieces of the whole movie had to involve Bruce prior to becoming Batman, and it had to be an absolutely massive and thrilling sequence. And we figured if we could sort of get the audience invested in Bruce in that way, then it wouldn't matter whether or not he had the cape and collar on. You're turning back. So I think you go back. I want you to look through because what we'll do is we'll cheat it. We'll cut. And I'll have the other side as well. Very good. can't walk down that thing slow, apparently. We were determined not to have this film feel like it had been filmed on a lot, you know, on a back lot, on a studio lot. We wanted there to be locations that would expand it, that would make the playing field and the canvas feel larger. He meets his rival, we obviously don't understand that till the end of the film, in a Bhutanese monastery, so we wanted to place this monastery and the village he goes through on the way to the monastery in a really dramatic landscape. Obviously, Bhutan's in the Himalayas, and we couldn't go there. So we were looking for a landscape you can film in above the tree line that isn't covered in snow or it can't access, which is always the big problem. And preferably, we have a frozen lake and a glacier. You know, you're looking for glaciers that sit below 3,000 feet, which is, there ain't many. I think there's only one in British Columbia, so we didn't want to go that far. So Iceland, we went to Iceland, and there you go, sea level, glacier, mountains, no trees, rocky landscape, felt like the Himalayas. So we built a village on the edge of a glacier, and we built the front doors of the monastery on just around the corner. We were there from January, till March building it. You know, it's obviously in its winter, so there's not very little light. Lots of storms, lots of rain. The monastery is being built as a miniature, and we're gonna put that in behind the front doors. So it's a combination of elements. The power of movies, you know, we can, we can kind of go anywhere and sort of tame it for our use. Because there used to be in a section of the world where there wasn't a tree, and there wasn't the sound of a bird. It was kind of like a gorgeous Beckett wasteland, you know. It was beautifully dangerous. You were stronger than your father. You didn't know my father. I know the rage that drives you. That impossible anger strangling your grief until the memory of your loved one is just poison in your veins. My thinking about starting in Iceland was I needed a frozen lake, and it was going to be gone by the end of February, so we had to start. It wasn't really so much Chris changing the schedule as Mother Nature, really, just because he had found this beautiful lake right beneath this stunning glacier. We were meant to have a couple of days to be able to rehearse and go through the sword fight. And, you know, they called us and said, right, that's it. You know, no rehearsals. Let's just go straight to it. We've got to film it because we don't know how long this is going to last because it could thaw out any day. You know how to fight six men. We can teach you how to engage 600. And luckily we did it because while we were filming that scene, we would hear these loud cracks in the ice and everybody would have to stand dead still, you know and they would call a few people off the ice and say, okay, you know, now it's only good to have five people out on the ice and no more than that. I mean, gradually the whole thing was falling apart as we filmed. Always mind your surroundings. Every so often, 
between setups, we'd see ice crumbling away at the head of this glacier and bits of rock and muck falling off that you knew this thing was a big living force that was moving towards you. Anger does not change the fact that your father failed to act. From my standpoint, really didn't involve that much. I mean, it was a handheld camera, a steady cam. We did one shot where I'm sitting on a sled and they scooted me across the ice to get a shot, which is in the movie. And so it was a really pretty low-tech way of filming. We were able to get, I think, 33 setups in one day or something and just hammer through it very much in the style of a small film. In a sense, that was a part of the film the most similar to films I've made in the past. Yield. You haven't beaten me. You have sacrificed sure footing for a killing stroke. <laughs> By the next day, it was pretty much just a lake again. And I like that, actually. You know, it's nice sometimes to kind of surprise yourself with the beginning and, and not feel completely ready. You know, sometimes there's a benefit I find myself to, to just getting started and jumping in. We wanted to go back out again, but we couldn't. And so we faked it a little bit after that. But the, all the really wide, beautiful stuff, we got that on the day that we were supposed to prep. I think every movie at some point has a location or a set that is going to be a nightmare no matter what happens. And you have to sort of suffer through that nightmare because it's something that the movie demands and has to be done. On this one, it was Iceland. Let's go for our final checks, please, and let's stand by the shoot. One of the first moments that Chris and I talked about in the film was when Bruce Wayne is climbing his way up to Raza Ghul's temple and he was covered in ice. And and bleeding and has to drag his battered body into this smoky grand temple at the top of the world. Okay, folks, everyone here has to come down the hill now, please. Without fail, everyone please. Our first day shooting that, we got 60 mile an hour winds and pouring rain and just really, really rough weather conditions. And instead of doing this crane shot that Chris and I had talked about doing at the bottom of the village, we ended up throwing the camera on my shoulder, kind of, you know, hunkering down and walking up the hill in the, in the blowing rain and getting as much as we could before we had to pull the plug and get out of there. Three, one. take one. OK, take the train, please. Iceland should have a lot more snow, but it's like anything. We have to um, cater for any... <laughs> see how the, how, the weather, how, the, how the weather changes. We're starting the, uh, start the snow. We've got various types of snow. We're actually bringing snow and ice to Iceland. Rain effects, well, we're leaving that to God at the moment. Bruce's climb up the mountain, when he goes up, you know, walks through the village, the guy tells him to turn back. That was a huge challenge, and it was more a challenge of stamina than anything else. It was freezing cold, the wind was roaring, and it was just miserable, quite frankly. And I think that the fact that we all got through that meant that we knew we were in a good place to continue. <laughs> Filming in Iceland, the first week of production was like being thrown into combat. I had a completely new crew, uh, an all-English crew that I'd never worked with before, who did a fabulous job, but we were all kind of thrown into the mud, wind, ice, rain, hail, whatever was hitting us there and had to work out all the bugs of not only our communication, but filming the movie and doing some crucial scenes. The other issue we had out there, of course, was we had to do Ducard and Wayne sliding down the ice and off the cliff edge, again, which we wanted to do for real. So we built an ice slide the week previously to the crew going out there. We took two containers of snow out there as a backup and ended up using the whole lot. We covered half the mountain in uh, artificial snow and we were exhausted by the end of that week. In terms of the stunt, we'd rehearsed. It was all pre-rigged, ready to go so that we don't keep the crew waiting. And then on the day, you're standing there thinking, I hope this works. And the guys who were part of the stunt team went out to Iceland while we were filming another sequence. They would rig it all, get the timing, the wire lengths and everything. And then me and Mark would step in on, on the day, do a couple of, couple of rehearsals, and then, then the tape rolled. Stand by, 
Buster. Just remember that the hand you're digging in with, that is supposedly taking the weight of both you and the guy you're holding. So a real stop on that, really hanging from that gauntlet. Roll cameras, please. Okay, here we go, guys. Good luck, everyone. Three, two, one, action. Cut there. Okay, um, if you want to change your lens, Wally, Chris is saying, we'll keep the same lens on here. We're going to do the drop down again. When we just had to rely on the wire stopping us again. Mm. It's, the, it's back to the trust again. You've got to rely on the, on the gents who are setting up the wires and, staff, and yeah, it's all the background guys as well. It's all the back. guys behind the scenes that you've really got to put your trust in. Let's roll cameras, please. It looks dangerous. It is dangerous because anything could go wrong, but it is safe. The cable that's holding those guys could hold 25 times more weight than those guys are on. The thing that's in the ground is 75 times more deep than it has to be. The compounding of all the specs to a degree were virtually impossible, although an accident could happen any time. So yes, it's very scary. Cut, cut, cut. You guys okay? Okay, okay? Thumbs up. Excellent. We needed one single shot, which is sliding with them down the ridge over the edge to be able to tip down to see the ravine. In pre-production, Chris and I talked about it, and we both really wanted to get a realistic uh, over-the-edge shot and not do it CGI, not do it blue screen back on the stage so you could really get the feel that you're there. And I think we were able to accomplish it, but that meant bringing this techno crane to the top of the mountain, and it was really the best way to get it. So it was the best tool for the job. It wasn't just a toy, you know, that we made the guys bring up there. <laughs> and then Chris also really wanted to get in there with them with a handheld camera and be right in with them as they slid down the hill. And so we took our usual low-tech approach to it to test it and to see really if it was going to be fast enough. Too slow. And also to get an idea of how much we were going to be able to shoot on location and how much we would leave behind to shoot on a set piece that we were going to build months and months later. What you're looking at is he's just sort of sliding towards a cliff edge. Yeah. So you're going down and then grab it with your right you hand. Armor on the Let's go with your Turn your body right. around. Like that. So on this one, we'll just get the lead into that. The horizontal black line. There's a great spirit that comes out of that in accomplishing what we were able to accomplish there. And I think that the attitude that Chris and I took towards it was, let's just go in there and get what we can and just get all that we can come out of there alive with great footage. I wasn't worried about starting with this outdoor, this sort of extreme location. Action! The crew and the cast and so forth came through with flying colors. That gave me a very high degree of confidence about how they were going to approach the rest of this rather large film. That's the thing, to stand up on that glacier and say, you know what, we decided to do this, we did it, and it's fantastic. Those kind of moments on movies are hard to forget. And be standing in the middle of it and going, yeah, baby. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Ah! Ah! 